Okay, in this video, I'd like to build on what I said, or kind of expand on what I said in, in relation to wave-particle duality, in terms of scientific models. And what I'm going to do, try and illustrate is the fact that science is all about models. And uh, what I said in the past was that we, we can never know what something, uh, E-T-H-I-N-G, is. We can never know what it is. All we can do is say what something is like. And the reasons for that are, some of the reasons, excuse me, for, for that are, is that we are not dealing with uh, human experience. Okay, and that's kind of the main thing. We're not dealing with human experience. Uh, human experience revolves around the fact that we are on Earth, clearly, and our experience is how things behave on Earth. And the, the, the fact of the matter is this, if you go on a larger scale and go to the cosmos, things don't behave like they do on Earth. And if you go to a smaller scale and go down to the size of an atom, things don't behave like they do on Earth. And we aren't necessarily able to understand how things are behaving. All we can say, all we can try and do is uh, relate what we see around us in the re in, in our world and kind of say, well, the thing we're observing in the in the atom behaves like something else and something which we understand. So you might say it behaves like liquid drops in, uh, in, in, in the water, for example, if you want to describe a nucleus. And we can never know, like, that's why wave-particle duality is is a model. It, it says that it, beca it behaves some, sometimes like a wave, sometimes like a particle, it is actually neither. And the reason we, we call it wave-particle duality is because we can never understand what it actually is, as we it's not in our experience. So just to build on that, I want to briefly discuss, and I'm going to try and be brief, very quickly, first of all, what the Bohr model was, just to set the scene about nuclei. And then I want to talk about two actual models. One is called the liquid drop model, and also the uh, the other one is called the shell model, and uh, model, and both of these are about the nucleus of an atom. And just to tell you, basically, a an atom is, uh, I suppose you could you could perhaps perhaps call it the fundamental building block of matter. So everything that you see around you is made up of of atoms. And up until reasonably recently, we thought there was nothing smaller than the components of an atom. And we found that not to be the case. But anyway, so first of all, just to show you, uh, to set the scene, we discovered atoms there about a, a, a hundred years ago or, or so, maybe 120 or 30 years ago. And we didn't know how they, they worked. So what uh, a guy called Niels Bohr did was he was trying to explain uh, the, the behavior of electrons, right? So before I talk about that, the an atom is composed of three particles, the proton, the neutron, and the electron. Now, I'm not going to explain what these are. If you want, go look them up yourself, because that will just add time onto this video. And basically, what he, the, the, kinda, the proposal at the time was that you had a spherical nucleus with all your protons and neutrons, and around your spherical nucleus, you had orbiting it your electrons and different orbits, different energy level orbits. Similar or analogous, I suppose, to the planets orbiting the sun. So most of the mass of the galaxy or of our solar system is in the sun. And then massive gaps, and then you'll have the orbit of a planet, another massive gap, and an orbit of another planet. Alright, so that's wh that's where that's where we were. And he he uh, he kind of um, suggested why the electrons don't just fall into the uh, don't fall into the center of the of the atom. All right, and what well, I won't say why, like, but basically he came up with this thing called the Bohr model, and it, it seemed to work. It fit all the experimental evidence, and it said it, it gave a reason for electrons not going falling straight into the nucleus after expending all their energy. All right, so that was the Bohr model, and that was where we stood for quite a while. And then a man called George Gamow, he's a Russian guy, Gamow came along and he, he worked, I suppose, with Bohr as well. Both of, those, both of those guys were part of this thing and what they 
decided to come up with was the liquid drop, uh, L-I-Q-U-I-D, the liquid drop model of the nucleus. All right. Now the point here is that it was accepted that electrons orbit the uh, orbit the central nucleus. So that is accepted. So now they want to try and describe what happens in the nucleus. And the model, and I'm stressing the fact that it's a model, they came up with was called the liquid drop model. And the point of the model was to try and fit experimental evidence. That's all they were trying to do, was come up with a way of explaining or fitting with what they're physically seeing in their instruments. And what they said was that a nucleus, N-E-U-C-L-E-U-S, that's spelled, I think it's spelled right. A nucleus behaves like a liquid in that uh, each drop is attracted. So it's attracted by other drops and the drops on the top, the uh, top drops, the top drops will say, or the top parts are attracted less. There is an average of a v e r a g e of we'll say I don't know z nucle uh, z um, nucleids surrounding each particle and so on right I won't get into this right the point was he kind of said that it behaves like your water droplets so a bunch of water droplets together make water of course okay or or your your river and he tried to kind of suggest that the behavior of the nucleus was similar to the behavior of a load of water drops together. All right, and that worked. And he came up with a thing called the semi-empirical mass formula. And that was great. And that worked perfectly. It fit experimental evidence. So that model was given the thumbs up. However, there are a couple of things which it didn't. One was the explanation of a thing called magic numbers. And magic numbers are uh, to do with nucleid, um, nucleus, N -E -U -C -L, nucleus, EUS stability. Okay, I won't talk about uh, STB, -A, -A, Excuse my spelling today, it's just I'm talking obviously at the same time, so it's hard to spell. <laughs> so it didn't explain magic numbers, it didn't explain a thing of the, the deviation um, from the, from N equals Z. So basically what this meant was that in most nuclei, in, uh, new atoms will say that the number of protons was equal to the number of neutrons. However, as the atoms got bigger, this, this was no longer correct, and the liquid drop model didn't explain it. So now what I'm trying to get at you is the liquid drop model no longer explained or fit experimental evidence. So it needed to be revisited. So they still kept the idea of the electrons orbiting the central nucleus, right? They still kept that idea. So they were happy with how the electrons were, uh, were working. So they needed to describe how the nucleus is working. And what they, what they said was, uh, if, when I say it, you probably will, will say, oh, that's, that's fair enough. But it, it's, it's still, it's kind of mad. And what they said was, inside the nucleus, inside the nucleus, the protons, I'm going to say, uh, let me think now, protons, a neutron is n of course, that's equal to neutron, and a proton is a z, alright, there the letter's given. And what they said was, how about, say, instead of having a spherical nucleus, which is solid, how about we go to shells, okay? So they came up with this shell model, and the point of the shell model is that each of the protons had its own orbits, like this, these will say are the, the z orbits, and then also superimposed on top of the z orbits, you had your neutron orbits, and we'll say that still is inside the, the spherical uh, nucleus, and then way outside that, I mean like way outside of it, you had the electron orbits. All right. So the point was everything was in a shell structure; everything was orbiting. Nothing was in a fixed position and everything was moving around. Now, that sounds kind of mad. It definitely did to me when I was, uh, it sounded mad to me when I was studying it first. But that's what they had. And this definitely fit experimental evidence. So they went from the Bohr model to the liquid drop model. And then they went to the, uh, they went to the shell model. And the reason they had to go this way and improve each of the models 
is because as their experiments get better and better, the experimental evidence no longer fits the Bohr model, or the Bohr model no longer explains the experimental, the experimental results, so they made the liquid drop model. This model worked for a while, and then their experiments begin to show the faults in the liquid drop model, so that had to be revisited, and they came up with the shell model. And I'm assuming at some stage, the model for the shell will no longer be no longer fit experimental evidence, and they'll have to come up with a new model. And at no stage are they actually describing what something is. They are not doing that. They're come up, coming up with methods to explain what they see experimentally. And that's what a scientific model is. That's what science is all about. So we will never really know what something is, but more what it is like. Alright, so that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.